This is Social Science Bites with me, Nigel Warburton. And me, David Edmonds. Social Science Bites is a series of interviews with leading social scientists made in association with SAGE. To navigate through modern life successfully requires myriad forms of cooperation with others. Cooperation in schools and places of work, in clubs and societies, in raising families, in politics. Richard Sennett is a social scientist at the London School of Economics. He believes that cooperation is a craft requiring a set of skills that over time we've begun to lose. Richard Sennett, welcome to Social Science Bites. Thank you. We're going to talk about cooperation. What is it that we're talking about when we talk about cooperation? Basically, cooperation is working with other people to do things you couldn't do for yourself. It's um, a natural impulse in human beings. It starts the moment people are born. The infants need to work with their parents to be fed. Children need to work with their teachers, with their peers in order to learn. And the adults obviously need to cooperate to work, to make communities work, and so on. What my concern with this is about are complex forms of cooperation where you are working with people you don't understand, people who are simply different from you, or people you don't like. And to practice those complex forms of cooperation, you need skills. That sort of demanding cooperation is a craft. Could you give an example of the kind of cooperation you're talking about here? Well, if you have, for instance, an ethnically divided community... The ones I've studied are mostly in the States between blacks and Koreans, for instance, or or Latinos and African Americans. Getting along together and making the community work requires suspending the notion that you'll cooperate well with people with whom you can identify, whose life experience is similar to your own. People who are different in those ways need to develop skills like good listening skills, so that they are able to fathom what people mean. They need empathic skills, know how to express curiosity and to follow up curiosity about what somebody else is saying. They need to have learned to manage aggression, and those are all experiential skills. So you're talking about a range of skills, particularly skills of conversation and mutual understanding and allowing space for people to interact in ways which allow people to keep their respect. That sounds almost like a, an Aristotelian moral position, that this is what a good person does, a virtuous person does. Is that what you're doing, creating a kind of image of what it would be to be a good citizen in a diverse society? I don't think I'm quite so moralistic. <laughs> I don't know whether that makes you a good citizen What being socially competent does means that when you're faced with challenges, you don't fall apart, and the social networks of which you're a part don't tear. Cooperation can be put to very, very bad ends. You can be very skilled at cooperating and doing very bad things. It's like craftsmanship. It's a technique which can be put to good or bad ends. I'm not very happy with a lot of the discourse around cooperative activity, which takes it as a good in itself, that it's nice to be cooperative. It can be that. But I think the problem for us today is that learning that kind of social competence so that you're able to manage complex situations, work with other people, is under threat for various reasons. Modern society is really ironically de-skilling people from many of the competences they need to deal with a very complex world. And as a sociologist, rather than a moralist, I'm interested in how institutions can disable cooperation. I'll give you an example of this. We have in the educational world, we have extremely rigorous now testing regimes for individuals for upward mobility. We don't correspondingly think about organizing educational institutions so the groups of students study together and talk. We're using computer technology to isolate students even more and more from communicating with each other so that they learn 
from each other. So you've got a regime which is putting a high premium on performance and not exploring ways to use modern communication tools so that people would learn together. If, as you've pointed out, cooperation can be used for evil as well as good ends, why would we be so concerned about the de-skilling of society in this particular realm? Well, because I think the more uh, incompetent people feel themselves to be in dealing with complexity, the more they revert to very aggressive, hostile ways of dealing with the outside world. If you feel competent to manage your circumstances, you're going to be less defensive, you're going to be more open, and so on. So that's why it matters. There is another model of conversation and debate where you have a conflict between strongly, perhaps aggressively expressed views and through that creative interaction between people, people do come to modify their views or become entrenched in their views. That is part of the rules of engagement, that you are prepared to have your views challenged vigorously. When you practice what the philosopher Bernard Williams called the fetish of assertion, you shrink the space for actually exploring something that's outside the boundaries of somebody else defending themselves. His critique was that basically a conversation should leave space for ambiguity and for things that are unresolved that aren't part of the sort of possessive armament of individuals or groups. And that requires a different kind of speech act, which is much more orientated towards the subjunctive, which leaves room for exchange. If you say to me, I believe X, and I say you're all wrong, it's possible that by you defending yourself and me attacking you, we might open up a space, or we might simply say, what a shit, he doesn't get it. Now, if you took the model of a parliament in a democracy, there the fetish of assertion rules. Many of us feel that that kind of open, opinionated debate has proved to be fruitful. Well, I'm not so sure I would agree with that. When I listen to debate in Parliament, particularly Prime Minister's question times, I don't see them really arriving at a kind of dialogical space of, of agreement. One of the things about declarative, aggressive speech is that it becomes more and more self-possessive. But I would respond to the issue you're raising in a different way. I think the productivity of more dialogic forms of cooperation, which is what I'm talking about rather than debate, is really founded in politics from the ground up rather than from the top down. I mean, the institutions that encase a parliamentary debate are basically performances made for a vast public, either of party or of television and so on. You're much more likely to get interactive and fruitful forms of communication and action if the structures that they occur in are face-to-face. -face. This is the theory of and practice of both community organizing and direct action, that the ambiguities in politics built from the ground up are more likely to privilege cooperation than they are this kind of possessive declarativeness that's enshrined in a different kind of power structure. I know many people who say it's a matter of their intellectual integrity that they assert their beliefs in direct language. Take something like a new atheist. They're going to say, look, there's no point in being ambiguous about this. I strongly believe there is no God and I believe what you're doing on the basis of your belief in God or gods is wrong. Now that isn't opening up this sort of gentle area for cooperation and debate. But they will say, look, if I disguise my actual beliefs, I'm not being true to myself. The notion that this is what I think and I can think no other is a recipe for both intellectual and social death. If we do have strong beliefs, the question is how we relate them to other people who have, may have equally strong beliefs. 
if it's a matter of trying to call attention to the fact in a confrontation that, that you believe something strongly, you've got a dead-end situation. It's very unlikely you'll be able to change your beliefs because what you're emphasizing is the strength of your own conviction. It's somewhat natural in a case when somebody comes to kind of new epiphany, new revelation, oh, I, I suddenly realize God is dead or something like that. The first impulse is to speak as you've spoken. But I think when you get more confident with things you believe, the need to underline the fact that you're very convinced recedes. That's, again, what I mean by becoming skillful with it so that you can be very comfortable with what you think or with who you are, but not have to be in the face of somebody else always about them to say, this is me! So this does sound like moralizing in a sense to me because you're saying Nietzsche's Zarathustra should have said God might be dead, (laughs) not God is dead. Well, he could believe it. I don't see Nietzsche having very good conversations with other people or ever working in a political collective. You described yourself as a sociologist. I'm really interested to know what sort of project this is. Is it based on statistical findings, empirical research, as it were, or is it more of a social theory based on large-scale observations about the changing nature of society? Well, neither. (laughs) I mean, the methods I've used in my work are intensive interviewing, which is ethnography, standard skill set for anthropologists and now many younger sociologists who have returned to ethnography. I'm quite interested because of that in issues of philosophically and issues of narrative because ethnographies are all about, they are created narratives. I don't lie awake at nights worrying about what is sociology. Nor do I think that there are inherent Kantian divisions between the humanities and the social sciences. I've learned a lot from literary theory and from novelists about conducting interviews. In the same way, when I've studied the physical realm, I've learned a lot, obviously, from architects, from artists. What I'd like to see happen in in the human sciences is that we become more subject-centered, that is, on subjects like the body or cities or injustice, rather than assume that the starting point is some distinctive form of knowledge that has this little Kantian tag, which is sociology or social thought. I'd say that the boundaries between what has been thought of as anthropology and sociology, pretty much erased in my work. I'm interested as well the way that you use autobiography. In my mind, I'm thinking you've talked about having been a talented cellist as a young man, whether those sorts of things have influenced the topics you've chosen. Well, some of that is just egoism on my part, but some of it also has to do with a very particular concern that I've I've had throughout my life, which is how to write in such a way that connects with a reader, how to revive the idea of the long, intense essay, which was so natural to earlier generations of social thinkers, rather died out in our time. And one of the ways to do that is not to hide behind the mask with your readers so that they don't know who's speaking to them. I don't like confessional literature, but I think if you're trying to speak directly to a a reader, you need to be able to establish an authorial voice which gives your reader some sense of who's talking to them. I'd say this is another enormous challenge that modern human sciences face, which is how to learn to write outward rather than to talk down to readers. You know, when I read these things where somebody does a kind of review of everybody else's thoughts on a particular topic, and there are lots of commentary or critiques which are sensible only to about eight or ten people. I think, why? If you're writing a book for ten people, email them. Unlike many sociologists, you do have a very wide readership, and I just wondered if that's part of your aim, that you feel not just as somebody wanting to express themselves and communicate their ideas, but there is some sort of 
role responsibility amongst sociologists to speak to a wider public? That's moralistic. My project is to write. I don't want to go into government. I don't want to be an advisor to anybody. I mean, often when we use this term public intellectual, what we're thinking about is somebody who is a kind of commentator, coach for politicians. That's not me. You mentioned that reading novels and the notion of narrative is very important in your work. Yet fiction writing doesn't necessarily purport to be true in a literal sense. It's exploring different sorts of perspectives, empathising with different sorts of characters. And yet social scientists, sociologists seem to have a responsibility to say things which are true if they can. Is there any antagonism between drawing from literature and being inspired by the sorts of narratives that you find in literature and doing what you do? We could get into a notion of what is truth and whether a string of numbers is more true than a sentence. Should we avoid that? (laughs) If you put that aside, I'd say that to me the canons of good social research are for the kind of work I do that, for instance, in an interview that you've done justice to the struggle that somebody else might have to actually say what they mean. Now, that's neither true nor false, but it's a canon of probity for the interviewer. And that means you don't take people as examples of a social condition, like being a white woman, working class resident of Neesden, but that they exist as a competent subject struggling to make sense of their experience. And when I look at what I think of as dubious social research based on interviews, it irons out the struggle for interpretation which most people have in trying to make sense of what's going on in their lives. I think this is a really a false issue. When we read writers like Tocqueville or Weber, we don't read them in order to know, well, he solved that one. We read them because they've been able to put their hands on really significant issues and say something provocative about them. The notion that social science solves problems so you can forget about it because we have the data It's a kind of imperialist recipe. That is to say that you don't have to think about this anymore because it'll solve the problem for you. I have all the data for it. Richard Sennett, thank you very much. Well, thank you. Uh, It's been very nice to talk to you. This podcast is made in association with SAGE. Transcripts of the interviews are available at www.socialsciencebites.com.